But I, I thought about how we're going through, and, and I've told you many times that in the youth, we're, we're going through the Gospel of John, and, and we've been just chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and, and um, just going through that with them and, and trying to, to teach them how to study the Bible, how to read the Bible, and, and how to go about it. And it's really not that much different than, than what I do when I'm here. Um, it's a little different um, just because there's, there's more interaction with them. Um, so, so I, I was thinking about a, I, I saw a, an old video, and it was a, in an interview with Keith Green. And some of you know him, some of you don't. But he was talking about himself when, when he was younger and how he was raised in basically an atheist home. He it wasn't really, he, he, he did Jewish things, and part of his family was Jewish, and they, and they would go, and, and they would go to the Seder, and they would do the Passover, they would do all these things, but he, he never understood what they meant. And he, he said, really, it was, they were, you know, very existential. The, the other part of his family was very existential, and it was all about, you know, it's mind over matter and all these things. And so when he got older, he, he started looking. And he's like, I know there's something. I don't know what it is, but I know there's something. And he said every religion he went to, he, he went to uh, the Muslims, to Islam. And they said, you know, Yes, Jesus, we believe Jesus was a prophet. Yeah, yeah, and Jesus was there. And he goes to uh, the Krishnas, which I don't know how, how prominent they are now, but, but they're like, yes, Jesus had a, you know, he had a Christ consciousness. And then he goes to the Buddhists, and they, the Buddhists say, yes, he was, a, he was a type of Buddha. And so he said, all these, I, I tried all these religions, and, and I kept looking, and I kept looking, but everything was pointing to Jesus. Everyone had, everyone had Jesus included. And he said they would say, oh yeah, Jesus is a way. Yeah, yeah, Jesus is a way. And, and the Buddhists would say, yeah, he was a, he was a type of Buddha. And, and yes, he's a way to reach enlightenment. And, and all these people, Jesus was part. And so he said, I just thought to myself, you know, if Jesus is a part of all these things, like why don't I just go and see what Jesus said? And so he says he goes to John 14. And Jesus just lays it out. And so that's where we're going to go tonight. And we're going to start in John chapter 14. And uh, just to give you some background, you, you don't really need it probably, but in, in chapter 13 um, is when, basically when the Last Supper started. And that's when Jesus came and, and he, he washed the disciples' feet. He washed all of their feet, even Judas, knowing that Judas was going to betray him. So he washes their feet, and, and they sit down to eat, and he starts telling them, you know, like this is the last time we're going to be together, and, and I, I have to leave, and, and one of you is going to betray me. And they were, is, is it me? You know, they didn't know. And then Judas gets up and leaves. They thought he was going, up, going to do, Jesus says, do what you have to do quickly. And they thought Jesus was telling him to go do his business because uh, it needed to be done quickly. So they didn't even know it was him. But that's the background, and that's where we're going to start in John chapter 14. That's what had just transpired. And, and Peter had, had said, you know, Jesus said, I'm going, and you can't go with me. And he said, why can't I? I I'll go with you, and, and I'll die with you. And he said, no. He said, right, not now you won't. In fact, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster even crows. And so that's where we start. And so if you, if you want to stand one more time, uh, John chapter 14. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way, you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? 
He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If she, shall, if she shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. You may be seated. So Jesus begins talking to the disciples after he has told him all these, told them all these things. And he begins with, don't be troubled. Okay, um, that's probably the biggest understatement ever because he has just told them, one of you is a traitor and they don't know who it is. He told them that one of you will betray me and he did, he left. And he says, and one of you is about to deny me, not once, but three times. And I'm about to leave you and where I'm going, you can't go. And then he says, but don't be troubled. I can, I'm sure that they were the opposite. They were very troubled. All that they knew, all that they knew of their life was falling apart. And, and I don't know if you've seen the movie, but you should. Um, Torture and Tortured for Christ. Um, it's a book, too, if, if you like reading and not watching movies. Um, but the kids watch movies, they hate reading. So... Um, but in Tortured for Christ, uh, Richard Wormbrand talks about that there's over 366 verses in the Bible. So over 366 times we're told not to fear. We're told not to be afraid. We're told not to worry. And when they captured him and they were taking him out of Romania and into a prison to beat him, he asked them, what day is it? And they said, it's February 29th. And he's like, I even have a verse for leap year. And so the verse that he had memorized was Psalm 56, 3, and that's what time I am afraid I will trust in thee. And so all throughout Scripture we're told, don't be afraid. We're told, don't worry. Jesus is telling his disciples, don't be troubled. And if, they, if anyone ever had a reason to be troubled, they did. But he says, what, what's the remedy to that? He says, you believe in God. And that word in, I know that's a, it's a little word, but in Greek it's E-I-S, that's ice. And that means into. So it's, it's not just believing that something is, it's putting your faith and your belief into that thing. And so he's like, you believe, you put your belief into God. Also put your belief into me. You trust in God. Don't stop. Continue to trust in him. Continue to trust in him. And trust me that it's going to be okay. It might be rough, but it'll be okay. And then he goes on in verse 2. He says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And I know we've talked about this uh, a couple of weeks back, but mansions, like, Really? I, I don't know. Right? And if you really look at that word, it, it's, it's mone, and, and it's only used one other time in the Bible. And it's actually in this chapter in verse 23, and it's abode. It's translated abode. So it doesn't make a lot of sense that in God's house there are mansions, like houses inside of houses. Um, really, it's rooms. It's, it's dwelling places. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And 
I think the idea of mansions is that in my father's house, even the rooms are great. They, even they are awesome, right? They're, they're, they're spectacular, and that's what he's saying. And he says he, he's going to prepare a place for them. He's going to prepare a place like a groom would for his bride. And so if you remember, um, <clears throat> a couple of years back we talked about it. You probably don't remember, I barely do. But we talked about the picture of a wedding in Eastern weddings, what would happen. When, when the groom and the bride were engaged, what would happen? The, the groom would leave the bride where she was, and he would go back home, and he would prepare a place for them to live. He would build on to his father's house. Most of the time, that's what he would do. He would build on to his father's house. He would add rooms to his father's house for them to live in. And he didn't know when he was finished. He would work and work and work, and his father would finally say, okay, you're done. And then he would go back and get her. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's going to prepare a place for us, his bride. And he's, and he's going to come back. right? He, he, he's going to prepare that place like the groom would for his bride. And Jesus said, if, if that wasn't the case, then I would have told you. I would have told you before that this is not true, but it's true. And, and there's a lot of if-then statements in, in this passage of Scripture. And the then... The then is implied, right? He says, if, if it weren't so, then I would have told you, right? The, the, the then is implied, but look for these statements, all these if statements. And then Jesus goes on to say, I'm going. I'm going to go. And then in verse 3, he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know and the way ye you know. He says, I'm going to prepare a place. I'm going to be gone for a while, but I will be back. I'm going, but I'll be back. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to prepare a place for us, but I'm going to return. I'm, I'm going to return to get you. I'm coming back, and I, I'm going to bring you to the place that I've prepared, like the groom would for his wife. And he's, he said, I'm going to bring you to that place, and we'll be together again. And then he tells him, you know where I'm going? You, you know how to get there? You know the way. And apparently they didn't. Because Thomas speaks up in verse 5 and says, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. And how can we know the way? Thomas says, how can we know? How can we know, Lord, if we don't know where you're going? Because we don't. How do we know how to get there? We don't know the destination, so we can't make a map. We can't plug it into our CPS and get it, right? That's camel positioning system, just in case you didn't know. But he says, if we don't know where you're going, then how are we going to get there? You see, they thought Jesus was just going to go to another town. They thought he was going, when he says he was leaving, they thought he was going to another town, another city. And they didn't know where he was going because he'd done that before. He said, I, I can't be here anymore. i got to go. Right? Uh, and all through John, you see that. Uh, Jesus was, was getting away from the crowds. Right? He'd have to go. He would withdraw and go. And he would say, I can't be here because my time has not yet come. He kept saying that. My time has not yet come. But now we know that his time has come. And so they didn't know, they didn't understand what he was saying. And if you read through the Gospels, that happens a lot, that they don't understand. And I think that happens to us a lot, is we read it just really fast, and we don't understand either. But at least Thomas spoke up and said, listen, we don't know. Can you please tell us? And so in verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's telling Thomas, I am the only way. He says, I am the way, singular. There's no other way. And if you look at Acts 4.12, um, 
It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the only way. Right? And if you look at John 1 and verse 14, it says, and, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of the Father, or only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's the only one. He's the only begotten Son. He's the only one full of truth. And then if you go back to John 1 uh, and, and verse 4, you see that in him was life. And the life was the light of men. He's the life. The only one. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, it tells us, For other foundation can no man lay that that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the only foundation of all, of everything, of all our belief. Christ is the only foundation. And then in Jude chapter, or actually there's no chapters, in Jude verse 4. It says, there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to, do, to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only God. He's not one of many. He's not one of many ways. He's not one of many truths. He's not one of many gods. He's the only God. And the only way to the Father is through the Son. The only way is through what He did. And you can't please God, right? You can't, not with what you do. You can't bribe Him. You can't impress Him. It's only through the righteousness of Christ that we come to God. It's only through His righteousness that we are able to come to the Father. Verse 7, he says, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know Him and have seen Him. Jesus tells him, you should have known. You should have known. If you knew me, then you would have known Him. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. And to know Christ is to know God. There's a lot of people that want to find God. They, they want to know God, but you have to know Christ. If you don't know Christ, then you don't know God. And that's what Jesus is saying. And then Philip, in verse 8, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice us. So he says, show us, show us. You keep talking about this, but why don't you just show us? Show us, he says, show us and we'll be content. Show us and that will be sufficient. Just show us, please, then we'll know. But they'd already seen him. He goes on in verse 9, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the very works' sake. He says, listen, I am one with the Father. I've told you this many times. And he he looks at Philip and says, how long, Philip? How long have you been with me? And you still still don't know me. You you know that whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And and I think we we tend to look at Philip and we tend to look at the disciples and we think, they are so dumb. Like, how did they not get it? Right? We, We like, how did they, you know, Jesus was talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and and they're like, oh no, we forgot to get bread. And Jesus is like, it's not about the bread, guys. And we're like, they're so thick-headed, but really? How many people have been in church their whole life and they still really don't know Christ? He says, how long have you been with me, Philip? How long have you been here? 
How long have you been coming to church and you still don't know who Christ really is? How long have you been coming and you still don't know his word? How long? We think that they're horrible and they're, they don't get it. But how long have we been here and read, we had access to this and we don't read it? We don't know it. So Jesus says, Philip, how, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't, don't you believe that the Father and I are one? Don't, don't you believe that? And you know that I don't speak my own words. I, I speak what he tells me to speak. I do what he tells me to do. I do it by his authority. And he is the one who does everything through me. Then he says, believe me. Believe that I and the Father are one. Or at least believe me because of what you have seen me do. Because you should know that only God could do these things. Only God could do these works. If you can't get all that, at least believe me because of what you've seen. Verse 12. He says, Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Now this verse is a little puzzling to me. And I think it's to a lot of people, because I don't, I, don't I don't think they get it. But great, greater works than Jesus? He says, whoever believes in me will also do the works I do, and greater? Because I'm going to the Father. What? What is he saying? Greater than Jesus. You're going to do things greater than Jesus? What does he mean? He means greater in extent. Right? He means greater in extent, not greater in power or greater in magnitude. You're not going to be greater than Jesus. You're not going to heal people. You're not going to do these things. Now, the apostles did that for a while, but that's gone. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about greater extent, spreading the gospel throughout the world. That's greater than what Jesus did. Jesus made the gospel possible, but spreading the gospel throughout the world through the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, that was only possible because Jesus left. Think about Jesus. How many places could Jesus be at one time? One. Right? He was, he was limited by his flesh. He could only be at one place at one time. But the Holy Spirit can be everywhere, all the time. And so, as, we, as the Spirit indwells the, us and, and enables us to, to preach the gospel message, yes, there are things that we will do in a greater extent than Jesus did. Because Jesus can't preach, he couldn't preach to everyone. He couldn't be in every pulpit. If, if, that would have been awesome if he, if he was. That's what he's talking about. And then even after this is another set of verses that I think people uh, misuse. Verse 13, he says, And whatever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And so a lot of people have taken this to mean, uh, just give me that in Jesus' name, right? Name it and claim it, right? Blab it and grab it, whatever you want to say. But that's what they think, right? They're like, Lord, I, just give me a Ferrari in Jesus' name. And they think that you're going to get a Ferrari. I've actually heard someone preach that, and, and I'm, not, I'm not lying. And I was like, well, okay, this guy's he's over, like, change the channel. <clears throat> But that's not what this means. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying you can just tack this thing on to the end of your prayer and, and he has to do it because you did it, you said in Jesus' name. That's not what he means at all. When he says in my name, he means for the purpose of his kingdom. For the purpose of Christ's kingdom. If you ask something for that purpose, he'll give it to you. Because that's your purpose. And if you're following Christ, that will be your purpose. And it's all for the glory of God. That's what he said, so that God will get the glory. 
If you ask something to glorify God, he's going to give it to you. It's not just a magic formula. It's not, it's not like abracadabra. He's like, oh, well, you know, a rabbit is going to come out of my hat. That's not what it is. You can't just say in Jesus' name and he will give it to you. That's not what he means. It's for his kingdom. It's for his honor, for his glory. Verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And this is another one of those if-then statements. It's if-then, it's not if-must. Our love for Christ cannot be separated from obedience. It just can't be. If we love him, if you love him, you will do what he said. You will want to do what he said. And he's not saying, if you want to prove your love, you must do what I say. And that's what a lot of people make it out to be. They're like, well, you know, you have to prove yourself. And if you don't do these things, then you're really not. Or if you don't do these things or you forget to do these things, then you're not any longer. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, if, if you love me, you're going to want to do what I said. You're going to want to follow what I said. If you love me, if you truly love me, you're going to do the things that I want you to do. And so he says, you'll keep my commandments. But what were his commandments? He had just told them, like, here's a new commandment. And what was that new commandment? That you should love one another like I love you. It goes beyond loving your neighbor as yourself. He's saying, love one another as I loved you. How did he love them? He loved them like a servant. They, he served them. And we should serve one another. And it's going to be sacrificial love too. That hasn't happened yet, but it will be. And he says, love each other as I loved you. And, and serve one another. Have faith in me. Have faith in God. Don't quit. Don't, don't quit having faith. Continue in that. Those were his commandments. Verse 16, he says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Jesus said, I'm going I'm to ask the Father to send you someone else to help you, another helper. And when it says another, it means another. That word means another of the same kind. Another one of the same kind. So Christ is God. The Holy Spirit is God. Obviously God is God. But he's saying, I'm going to send you another person. I'm going to pray that God will send you, the Father will send you one more person. Just like me. And he's going to come alongside of you. He's going to encourage you. And he's going to be with you forever. And he says, this, this person that's coming is the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. And we need to understand that without the Holy Spirit, we cannot know God's truth. We just can't. We can only know him. We can only know Christ through the Spirit. And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, we talked about this this morning. It says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. For the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. We can't know. We can't truly know Jesus. We can't truly know Christ unless the Spirit is in us. And that's what he's telling them. He's saying, listen, in verse 17, he goes back and he says, Listen, the Holy Spirit 
He is dwelling with you. He is with you now. But he's going to be in you. And so we see that now he's telling them, now the Spirit is with you. In the future, he's going to be in you, in us. The Spirit dwells in us. And so he's telling them, this is, this is before Pentecost, right? Before Pentecost, the Spirit was with man. After Pentecost, the Spirit is in man. And so that's the only way. That's the only way we're ever going to truly know Christ, is if the Spirit dwells in us. And as we prepare to close and, and as Brother Russell comes up here, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. And if you want to go ahead and stand and get ready for the invitation. And the questions are these. Do you know him? Do you really know him? Or are you like Philip and you've dwelt with him, but you don't really get it? You don't really know. And the other question is, do you want, do you want to keep his commandments? And I'm not saying that that's going to make you special, that, oh, yes, I, I've kept all the commandments. Because we know that the rich young ruler came and he said, I kept all the commandments from my youth, but he had an issue, right? But do you want to keep his commandments? None of us can keep them. But where is your desire? Is your desire to, to keep his commandments, is your desire to be obedient to him because you love him? Or is your desire to yourself? Do you desire to follow him? That's the question. Because he's the only way. If you're not following him, if you don't know him, you are lost. Think about that tonight. And think about that, that, that we have to come to a point where we understand. We have to make a decision. Either we know him or we don't. And if you have questions, if you have any questions whatsoever in your mind, come talk to me. Come talk to Brother Cliff. And get it straight. Get it right in your mind so you know, yes, I know. Don't spend one more day worrying or being anxious about whether you're in him or you're not. All right?